one of the beautiful things about the gospel message is there's a profound simplicity to it. When the Lord asks you to do something, do it right away. When the Lord asks you to do something, do it right away. I think we've in learned this, this uh, wisdom from daily life. When we're children, when mom and dad ask us to clean our room, the room is going to get cleaned one way or another, right? But how many times have we had that experience of we fight against it, we fight against it, we cry, we kick, we scream, we spend time taking our stuff that's supposed to put, be put away and shove it under the bed. And then mom and dad say, okay, you didn't clean your room. Keep working at it, keep working at it. And then finally it gets clean. But we would have had so much more time to play outside if we just right away just said, okay, and did it. And we probably have a lot more fun doing it than the way in which a lot of times that it happens. So when the Lord asks you to do something, do it. Now today we, we hear from our friend Jonah. And one of the interesting things about this reading is that it sounds like Jonah was a really good prophet. And he did what the Lord wanted him to do. But sometimes you get a verse here and then you skip a bit. And then a verse here, and you skip a bit. And a verse here, and you skip a bit. And if you were to read the whole story, you would actually realize that Jonah is probably the worst prophet ever. And the story of Jonah, the book of Jonah, which is a great one to read if you're looking for a good book that's just five chapters, and it's told in story form, so it's very, very easy to follow. This would be a great one to just go into. And if you read it, one of the things that's interesting is it's actually written as a satire comedy. It's the funniest book in the whole Bible. And what it does is it shows how God can take one of the worst prophets ever, a half-hearted prophet, and actually still bring about the conversion of one of the most vicious people. And we don't want to be like Jonah. So we want to be like the guys in the gospel. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. When, when Jesus comes, he's proclaiming this good news. He's saying now is the time of fulfillment. Not tomorrow, but right, right now. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is walking by you right now. And so repent. Let go of this thing here and hold on to me. Not tomorrow, but right now. And that's what you see with these first apostles. Jesus calls them. And Jesus keeps walking. He doesn't stop. He doesn't wait for them. But he says, I'm on my way to bring salvation to all of you. And I want you to come after me. But you need to come now. Because if you wait and say, well, maybe tomorrow, well, maybe I'm already on my way. If any of you have ever seen that beautiful series, The Chosen, I, I just heard that quite possibly in Easter is when season two will come out. But there's a beautiful scene in there where you have this character, Nicodemus, and he knows what he should do. He's afraid of doing it. But he knows that he needs to follow the Lord. And there's this scene where he's wrestling and wrestling. And they're all getting ready to go off. And he just can't do it. And there's this kind of sad moment in which he's left behind. And could have been one of those apostles. But also what we recognize, and I'm sure that later on in season two or season three, I don't think we've seen the last of Nicodemus. Because in scripture, it's Nicodemus who then is able to come to the cross and take Jesus down from the cross. And he does that not during the night when he first meets Jesus, 
When he first comes and talks with Jesus, he goes during the evening when no one can see because he's afraid. Now he comes in the light, unafraid. And so, yes, Jesus says, come follow me now. But even if we make a mistake, even if we fall, even if we, we know what we should do and then we just are, we're afraid, yes, the Lord goes on, but there's this way in which he always just keeps coming back to us, saying, please, follow me. Because remember how we learned yet last week that song that ultimately is radiating from the Lord. Everything that we've been looking for is with him. So why wait for tomorrow when the dream that has been dreaming within your heart is right in front of you at hand? Why would you wait? So let's look at Jonah for a moment and let's just see how we don't want to act. So Jonah hears the word of the Lord and it's important for us to recognize this. There are times and this is where, like from the readings last week, we need to spend time with the Lord. There are times in which we need to discern God's will, times in which we need to sit at his feet and say, Lord, where are you calling me? What are you calling me to do? But a lot of times when the Lord actually speaks to us and he speaks to us through the scriptures. So if we're like, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Well, one of the things is, well, are we listening to the readings of scripture? Because that's what the Lord wants us to do. And so we can sometimes just keep discerning and keep discerning and keep discerning. And then a hundred years go by and we keep discerning and we keep discerning and we never actually follow the Lord. We're like, okay, hold on. It's, a, it's like we kind of create a committee within our minds. Say, well, okay, Lord, we're going to vote on this first. And, and, you know, we might get back to you next year or something like that. And, and we keep doing that. And yes, there's part of us that needs to stay and keep discerning and keep going deeper into God's will. But part of the Lord is just saying, well, just follow me and find out. Notice how he just says, come after me, come and see, follow me, and then you'll find what you're looking for. So there are certain moments in which the Lord pokes our heart and he says, this is what I'm calling you to do. And we have to be careful not to rationalize that into continual discernment because there's discernment and then there's call for action following the Lord. And that's why we have these two readings from the gospel last week and the gospel this week about Peter and Andrew, James and John, and Peter and Andrew, James and John, because there's both dimensions. There's the part of sitting and waiting upon the Lord, but there's the part for action and following him, even if we don't have the whole story. So Jonah Here's the word of the Lord. So he knows what he's supposed to do. The Lord says to him, go this direction and preach to the people who are your enemies. And Jonah knows what he's supposed to do. He says, no. And he goes the opposite direction. And he goes in a ship for Tarshish. And what's interesting about that place ge geographically and Nineveh is that it's 180 degrees from where Jonah was. So he doesn't just turn a little bit. He just says, I'm completely going the opposite way to run away from you, Lord, because I don't want to do what you're calling me to do. And we learn later, it's because he was mad that God could be so merciful to people that he didn't like. And he even says, he says, I'm mad enough to die. He's having like a tamper tantrum. And he's saying, God, I knew that you are great and merciful. And I knew that if you, if, if the people heard the message that you wanted me to preach, then they would turn their hearts and then I'd have to call them family. They, they would be part of my family of faith. And I just didn't want that. Do we ever do that sometimes? Lord, I love you, but I don't want these people within my church. I don't want these people within my parish. Yes, they can be part of your family, Lord, but I don't want them to be part of my family. And yet the Lord ultimately says, what's it to you if I'm merciful to them in the same way that I'm merciful to you? Shouldn't you rejoice? And we see this theme over and over in the word of God. 
God is merciful. And we have to learn how to have his kind of mercy. So now we go back to, jo or to, to Jonah again. He's going the opposite way. And what's funny about it is he gets in a boat and he tries to run away from God. Now, if you ever have children or grandchildren, you've seen how sometimes they close their eyes and they cover their faces and there's this sort of mysterious magical moment in which they really believe that you can't see them. And you might just be looking at them and they're kind of like hiding and like, yep, you can't see me. That's what Jonah is doing to God. And don't we do that sometimes to him? Lord, you can't see me right now. And the Lord is like, I got the whole world in my hands. I can see you trying to go in your little boat away from me. But just like that song, there ain't no mountain high enough to keep me away from you. That's what the Lord's singing to Jonah as he's trying to get away in his little tiny boat. Now ultimately, the Lord puts Jonah in time out. He takes a, a whale, a big fish, and eats Jonah. I mean, there's something really funny and creative about how God gets our attention. Jonah was supposed to clean his room. And he tries to get out of it. And so the Lord puts him in time out. He sends a big fish, eats Jonah. Jonah is sitting in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights without any cards, without any sort of fun. It probably stinks in there and he's just twiddling his thumbs. And then finally, after he has his time out moment, he gets shot out of the whale. Again, it's really kind of funny if you think about it. Maybe there's people that are just kind of hanging out on the beach, and all of a sudden they see this prophet fly through the air across the horizon, like one of the blue angels rocketing over them, and they're just kind of like, oh, who's that guy? Oh, that's Jonah. And then Jonah just kind of hits the, hits the sand. And what's amazing is the next verse is very telling because it says, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And it's the exact same grammatical structure, words and everything as verse one. So it's as if the Lord said in the beginning, Jonah, this is my will for you, do it. And he tries to get out of it. He goes through all of this stuff. He goes through all of the grief of getting eaten by a whale, getting spit up, and all these different things. And then he ends up in the exact same place. And the Lord kind of comes over to him gently and just kind of taps him on the shoulder and says, Jonah, let's not do that whole thing again. I'm calling you to go this way. And I don't want to have to send another whale after you. Jonah gets the point, he goes, but then we hear about in the first reading today that he doesn't even finish the whole message. He just says, 40 days, Ninevites, and you're all gonna die. And he probably says it with a lot of glee because he doesn't like these people. I mean, that's the kind of message the, the Lord was saying, preach that yes, they need to repent, there's gonna be destruction, but if you repent, then I'm gonna set you free. And he forgot that whole part, probably selectively forgot it, and said, okay, I'm going to do this, but I'm still going to try to find a way to keep these people out of my family. And so I'm just going to tell them they're all going to die, and then they're just going to get mad, and they won't turn to God. But God has other plans. He then puts on the heart of the pagan king to finish the whole rest of that message, where the pagan king gets up and says, citizens, We've done the wrong thing, and we need to turn to the Lord. We need to give him all of our heart. And that conversion is so complete that it's not, even the, it's not even the humans who reach out with sackcloth and ashes. This is where we get Ash Wednesday from. But it's the animals, too. Sometimes you miss that part, but even the cows, they put on sackcloth and ashes. They put, they put ashes on their head, and then they lift up their hands to heaven. So you have all the humans there, but then all the animals are going, Lord, save us too. As if to say, God is saying, Jonah, I'm going to get my will done one way or another. But it's so much worth your time to just follow what I'm asking you to do. Let's not be Jonah. 
Let's listen to the word of God that is spoken to us every Sunday at Mass. Every time, actually, we open the scriptures. God is speaking to us. Are we listening? Do we have our radio frequency on just like right now? If you moved it just a little bit, you'd all of a sudden hear another song. Maybe all of a sudden heavy metal would start popping on. That's very different from the gospel message. Do you see how sometimes we're not tuned into what God wants to tell us, but he's always speaking to us. That's where we need to have prayer each day and to ask the Lord, Lord, I want to listen to your voice. But then once we hear like Jonah or like Peter and Andrew, James and John, where they hear the Lord saying, this is my will for you. Follow me. This is what I want you to do. Preach. Do we have the courage to do it? Or are we like Jonah and say, uh, no. Because one way or another, it's going to happen. But it's so much better to be on that side of working with God's will than working against it. There's so much, it's so much better when mom and dad say, clean your room now. You're going to have so much more time to play and so much adventures if you just do it right then and there. So what is the Lord speaking to you today? What's on your heart? that maybe has been nagging you in 2021. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. And just do it.